Welcome to the New Wine Merseyside celebration. My name is Tim. I lead a church plant in St. Helens called The Mount. Um, and my name is Kate, um, and I am the vicar of St. Bart's Church in Raby. If you are new, we would love for you to um, think about being part of um, the area and the network that New Wine has created in the north. And so if you're interested in finding out a little bit more information about that, there's lots of other things going on. We have a kingdom leaders thing, which happens at the moment four times a year with different guest speakers coming. And there's also a mailing list so you can find out a little bit more information about all the things that are happening. So do get in touch if you're interested. Um, we would love to hear from you. We're going to watch a little bit of a video just about the Leaders Conference, which is coming up really soon. It's really exciting. Let's watch this video now. We fix our course, we set our sails, not knowing the challenges ahead. The winds rise and we are overwhelmed and we find ourselves weary from the battering of the storm. But God's presence is with us in the darkness, beyond the loss. As the clouds part, we rejoice. With spirits refreshed and vision restored, we dare to dream together and to look forward once again. The time has come to encourage one another, to strengthen ties. We will set out expectantly, full of faith and hope for what lies ahead. Passion for mission renewed, purpose and direction revealed. Oh, look around, people of God, and rejoice, for he is making all things new beyond the storm. So I am really excited about the Leaders Conference. I can't wait um, to be part of it. It's a real shame that we can't obviously be together. Um, normally we'd all gather in one place and that'd be fantastic. Of course we can't do that at the moment. But it's going to be fantastic to join in with that leadership conference uh, online. And in case you think, oh, well, I'm not a leader, that's not for me. Actually, do you know what? It is for anybody who is in leadership in any form. So Whatever your role in church or in the workplace or in the community, if you um, lead anything at all or in any way have a, a leadership role, we would love you to come and be part of that. It's a fantastic event for um, lots of people from your church to go to um, together and then you get a chance to talk about it and, and review how it all went. We've got some really fantastic things lined up. We've got some fantastic keynote talks. We've got some TED talks, um, some seminars, some kind of round table sofa chat events. It's really going to be um, fantastic. So I'd encourage you to have a talk to some of the people in your church because um, the booking rate gets a little bit cheaper as well if more of you go together. So do get involved um, with that. And the great thing is as well, it's not just the days of the conference, but the Monday before, um, we're encouraging people to use that as like a prayer day and a preparation day. Then that evening is the first celebration. The Tuesday and Wednesday are then packed days full of loads of content. And then the Thursday is like a bonus day, a resourcing day with loads more fantastic things on offer. And the really exciting thing as well is that if you book now, we're launching um, something amazing. You might have seen this if you were... Um, watching uh, the, the kind of countdown video or you can check it out online. We're launching something called New Wine Online, which is an incredible resource library. And we'd love you to join up and become part of that um, membership community um, and watch um, so many amazing resources. So talks from previous New Wine events are going to be put on there. There's going to be kind of training sessions. There's going to be kids resources, worship resources, and um, so much fantastic stuff on there um, to uh, resource you and to encourage you and to help you grow in your faith. And if you sign up now, that's not going to be um, kind of launched live until 
March when the leadership conference happens. But if you book now for the leadership conference, you get like a free um, preview of that resource. And you can have a look at all the stuff that's on there for free um, up until March. And then after that, um, you can sign up um, and join that community. So there's a really brilliant incentive to sign up to watch that. So do, uh, do get involved. We would just love you to be part of that event with us. Fantastic. We're going to worship together now. Um, but before we do, we just want to spend a moment just inviting God's Holy Spirit to come and to be with us. So wherever you are, if you're sat at home and uh, you're watching along, we just ask you to just get a bit comfier. Uh, you might want to stand where you are, close your eyes, hold your hands out. And let's just invite God's Holy Spirit to come and to speak to us. Let's praise and worship his name. So, Father God, we thank you for who you are. Thank you that you love us. And amongst the storm, amongst all the different things that are going on at the moment, Lord, thank you that we can set this time aside to be with you, to encounter you, to grow closer to you, to praise you. Lord, help us in this time to know that you are close. And to know that you see us. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive. All my fears I try to hide. It was my turn till I met you. Sing with one voice when you call my name. It's our I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now 
how you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open When you call my name
Why don't we lift up his name? The name of Jesus, our living hope. There's no one like him. There's no other name that compares to the name of Jesus. When we sing in our own song, declare he is good. The goodness of God lives amongst us. Hallelujah. He is here. Let's lift up his praise. He resides in the praise of his people. Let's lift up his name. There's no one like our God. Just uh, stay in that moment of worship. Just um, stay in that place of encounter with God as you've been, um, maybe you've been singing um, on your own at home, just what kind of wherever you are, but just stay in that moment of worship. Worship at all that we are, delighting in all that who he is. to sit just for a moment in his presence. Allow him to love you. Jesus, you are our living hope. 
And we are so grateful for that, Lord, how we need that at the moment. We need hope. Life is hard. And we need to know that hope. And we are so grateful, so thankful that you, Lord Jesus, are our living hope. And so just in this moment, even before Mike comes to speak, just in this moment, allow yourself to believe and trust in that hope. To kind of re-center yourself, refocus your gaze on the Lord who is our hope. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So this evening we are coming to you live from Emmanuel Church in Fazakali and we have got uh, the vicar here um, of Emmanuel, Mike Hindley, who is going to speak to us. Mike and I are great mates. We trained together at college far too many years ago um, and so it's a real joy um, for me to... Um, I'd like to introduce him to you. I guess lots of you already know him, um, but at least to kind of be his warm-up act and, uh, and pray for him just as he speaks. So Lord, thank you so much uh, for Mike. Thank you for um, the person that he is, for the leader that he is, but most of all, Lord, for the disciple that he is, for uh, the way his life um, is dedicated to knowing you more. And, uh, and Lord, I pray for him tonight that all that he has prepared, all that he has um, kind of gathered together in his heart, uh, that he would speak your words and your truth to us this evening. So give him all that he needs, Lord, as he speaks, and give us hearts to be receptive to what you want to say through him. Amen. Well, thank you, Kate, and uh, a warm welcome from me to uh, Into Emmanuel for this New Wine celebration. It's an absolute treat and pleasure to be here with you uh, this evening. I'm going to begin by um, sort of sharing with you one or two statements that I've read uh, this week uh, about our current situation this time of pandemic. I'm quite shocked by them, if I'm honest. Um, one is, somebody wrote, my mum always told me I wouldn't accomplish anything by lying in bed all day, but now look at me, I'm saving the world. <clears throat> uh, what's the difference between COVID-19 and Romeo and Juliet? One's the coronavirus, the other is a Verona crisis. And my last one, which is Getting, it's just going to be worse. I'm sorry about this. People here are rolling around in pain. I ran out of toilet paper and had to start using old newspapers. The times are rough. Um, anyway, sorry about that. I'm going to move on. I mean, it is good to make light-hearted uh, you know, jokes about these things, isn't it, from time to time. Uh, because we are battling with uncertainty, anxiety, despondency, and fear amongst the whole range of other things. So that's why I thought tonight it would be great for us just to come in together and find an oasis and the liberating truth and power that the Word of God brings to our lives. And you can see there, uh, just above me, the words, the God who sees you. We're going to be thinking about the life of Hagar from Genesis uh, chapter 16 and 21, where we are going to discover there is a God who sees us. So I'm going to read uh, from uh, Genesis chapter 16 and uh, hopefully those, uh, those words, in fact I can actually read following along on the screen so I'll do it from there. So we're going to pick up the story of Hagar. She's a maidservant to Sarah, Sarai and Abram. So Genesis chapter 16 verses 5 to 14. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave into your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. 
Then Sarah ill-treated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave him this name. So she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. So in that story, we hear of the God who sees us. And the big takeaway, big takeaway number one for us tonight is going to be that no situation or no person is beyond God's saving help. Here in uh, chapter 16, Abraham and Sarai are given God's promise. They've been given God's promise, but God seems to have forgotten about it. He promised them a baby so long ago. So they come up with an idea and a plan to help the Lord out. And if you go back to verse 2, you'll see that Sarai, she's, she's being very honourable in some ways. She knows she's beyond the natural age of having children. So she says, Abraham, let's, let's help God. You go off, sleep with my maidservant Hagar, and then she will have a baby and God can fulfil his promise. But in doing that, they've stepped away from God's promise. And it's not long before their plan starts to cause them pain. By the way, it's always the result of trusting our own plans more than God's will or his word or his way. Pain always follows when we decide that we know best. Just look what happens here in our story. There's enmity. Everyone is falling out. In verse 4, we see Hagar despises Sarai because she's pregnant and Sarai isn't. In verse 5, Sarai blames Abraham. Verse 6, he's very passive and his passivity leads to abuse, the abuse of Hagar. It's not good and the result is that Hagar flees. The whole thing is bad. But the question is, is it too bad for God? Are these people too bad for God? After all, they haven't trusted him, have they? They've sinned, they've acted shamefully. And, uh, and we have to say, these are some of the heroes of the Bible. No, they don't deserve anything from God. But the thing I love about the Genesis stories is that we learn so much about God's character through, uh, through these stories in the first book of the Bible. And we see here that God is a God of grace. And in verse 7, we read those magic words, don't we? That there's Hagar, who's made a complete mess of everything. She is in a complete mess. And in verse 7 it says, The Lord, the angel of the Lord, found Hagar. And I love those words, that God stepped out and found her. Here's a God who goes out and searches for his lost people. Despite any rejection that the people have of God, despite the failure, despite not even being able to live up to their own standards, 
God continues to search them out. Just like in Adam and Eve, he went out to search them. After they had made a complete mess, he went out and he, he searched them out. And ever since then, God has searched for lost people. And what is even more amazing in this story, in verse 10, is not only does Hagar discover the God who sees her, but in verse 10, let me just read, the angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Not only does God find her, but he gives her a promise. We'll come back to that in a moment. But an incredible promise. So, as we see, nothing or no one is beyond God or beyond his help. In fact, he works in and through all the mess to bring us a great treasure. He works all things together for the good of those who love him. That's a great verse, isn't it, for us to remember. But no matter how messy things are in life, somehow God is behind it, still working behind everything to bring them to good. So my question tonight is, do you feel like you're beyond God's love, beyond his grace? Do you think that your life is without hope completely? That you've forfeited God's purpose for your life? Well, if that is the case tonight, then don't worry, you're in good company. Even the great heroes of the Bible have found themselves in that place. And God's people throughout the ages find themselves in that place. And that's why we have saints like St. John of the Cross, who wrote his most famous piece, his famous book, The Dark Night of the Soul. But you see, God is bigger than everything that we face. He's bigger than your mistakes. He's bigger than your shame. He's bigger than your circumstances. He's bigger than your weaknesses. He's bigger than your worries. He's bigger than your opposition. And he's bigger than your apparently unbreakable darkness. No matter what you're facing today, God is bigger than it all. And nothing is beyond him. Look here in Genesis 16. He steps in as the angel of the Lord. Now, the angel of the Lord is a phrase that's often used to describe the presence of God. And he comes in and he lifts Hagar up. He lifts her up and gives her a new life. And he's done that for us in the person of Jesus. Though we often have fallen we find mercy in Jesus. Though we feel unlovable, we find love in Jesus. Though we feel hopeless, we find everything we need in Jesus. And it is coming into that encounter that we find all we need. In our Old Testament, in Genesis... Hagar finds that encounter with the Lord. In verse 13, she says, You are the God who sees me. Now I have seen the one who sees me. Can you feel the intimacy in Hagar's experience? She has seen face to face God. Tonight there is a God who sees you. He is with you. He will walk with you. He loves you. He's with you to guide and lead you. He calls himself the good shepherd and he can see us through everything. There we are. And Hagar's life is restored. She's lifted up. She has a a new promise from God, a new encounter with God that changes everything. So it's brilliant, isn't it? That's, that's enough. No more problems, right? No more pains. Uh, no, that's not true. Because we come across Hagar again 13 years later. And although it's only four chapters on or five chapters on, we go back into Genesis chapter 21. 
and from verses 8 to 20. I'm going to read that now. So again, you'll see the words on the screen, hopefully, where you are, and you can read along there. Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 to 20. Let me just preface this with uh, the story that precedes it. Sarai now has a baby. I think we need to go back a couple of uh, slides on the. That's it, thank you. And here's the baby. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham gave a great feast. But Sarah saw the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham, was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son. For that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. Then God said to him, do not be distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took the food, some food, and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulder and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying. And he, as he lies there, lift Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew. He lived in the desert and became an archer. So life goes on, but the abuse and the brain and the breakdown continue. Hagar is once again sent out pretty much to die. So here's takeaway point number two. God's promises still stand. And I might want to add, God's promises still stand even when it doesn't feel like it. Hagar had trusted God. She'd gone back to her mistress, she'd behaved, I think, and she'd done everything that was asked of her. She went back to her mistress with God's promise, but look where it got her, back to where she started. In fact, now I would say it's even worse, because in that passage when she goes into the desert for the second time, it's not just her, it's her son who is with her, the boy that she cares about, and she has to watch him die or so she thinks. But God comes again. Does God see her? Yes, he does. He searches her out, doesn't he? He searches her out again. Because God, as we said a moment ago, is a searching God. You probably remember that story in, in uh, Luke chapter 15, where Jesus tells three parables about something that's lost. And you remember the story of, the, of the, the lost sheep and the shepherd goes out and he leaves the 99 and he goes out for that one sheep. Well, here we again see in Genesis chapter 21 just what Jesus is talking about. A God who searches for lost people. A God who cares for every single person. No matter of their social status, Hagar is at the bottom of the heap. She's a maidservant. No matter of their predicament, of their past, of their failures, or whatever it is, God searches. And again, he comes out to the desert searching, and he meets Hagar. 
The first time Hagar discovers she matters to God, here in chapter 21, she discovers that God's promise still stands. She really can trust him. Ishmael is the sign that God's promise stands. Who is it that God hears in this passage? In, in Genesis chapter 21, did you notice? Did you notice who uh, God heard? I've got a forward uh, on in my Bible to find the right chapter. But it says, as the angel uh, meets Hagar, he says in verse 17, the writer says, God heard the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy. Do you know what the name Ishmael means? Ishmael means God hears. In the first passage we read, Genesis 16, we see God sees. El Aroi in Hebrew. You know, there's so many names for God in Genesis. And I think that's probably partly because we're still getting to know who God is. Because we've got the rest of the Bible for God to reveal himself. And he perfectly reveals himself in Jesus. But here we see God sees El Roy. And then in Genesis chapter 21, again, Ishmael, God hears. And as Ishmael, the boy who has the name, God hears. The one who is the promise, the sign of the promise. God comes true to his word and he hears. He hears the boy. He hears and he steps in. And then what happens? As she takes hold and remembers God's promise, she has a new revelation and provision for all that lies ahead. An encounter with God, knowing that God has heard her, leads to a whole new sense of provision. It somehow makes everything okay. Verse 19, we read that God opened her eyes and she saw an oasis. And because of this encounter with God, taking hold of God's promise that still stands, a new revelation is birthed and they are able to move into their destiny. So the question is, is that possible for us today? We have God's promise, and I'll come on to what God promises for us. We have God's promise, but is it possible for us to find ourselves moving through times of trial, moving through darkness into light? Well, I want to tell you a story, and it's a personal story. I thought, oh, I could think of so many great saints I could tell you about. I could tell you about... Um, Brother Andrew, or Corrie ten Boom, or Jackie Pullinger. And can I implore you in this time, in this season, to read great stories of how God has moved in the lives of the saints, of the people of God. Get around stories of people in your churches who have heard God and seen God, the God who sees them and hears them and who has answered their prayers. We must tell these stories to one another. We must tell the Bible story to one another. But I'm going to tell you a story that's close to my heart because it's personal. And it's to do with my mum. Now, my mum died at the end of 2019. And, uh, but what a lot of people don't know about my mum is, is that she was, she was widowed at the age of 40. She came to faith when she was in her early 20s, about 21, 22. She was in Lower, uh, Lower Bevington Methodist Church. And she heard a talk, an evangelistic talk. And she encountered God. She came to Jesus. She gave her life to Jesus. For some unknown reason, she married a vicar. And they started this life together. They had one, two, three, four children. It took them four goes to get it right, because that was me, number four. And uh, by the time they got to number four, everything was good. Four kids. But just before I was two, my dad suddenly died of heart attack. And my mum found herself widowed 
crying out to God with four children, four young children, not knowing what she was going to do. She had to move out of a house. She had to find a new home. She had to provide for all of us. It was a nightmare. And uh, what she did one morning was she had learned that God was trustworthy. Um, she knew that God could be trusted. She'd seen God move in her life. But she'd never been in a situation like this. And one morning, she sat down on her knees and she called out to God. She said, God, I have these four children. And I don't know how I'm going to help them. I don't know how I'm going to bring them up. I don't know how we're going to survive. And I've got two girls, but I've got two boys. And they don't have a father. And I don't know how they're going to cope. I don't know how I'm going to help them become men. And she was drawn immediately to a verse from Isaiah chapter 54, verse 13. And that verse says, All your sons will be taught by the Lord, and great will be your children's peace. All your sons will be taught by the Lord. Don't worry, Jean, God said to her. I've got it. And in that moment, she heard the Spirit of God. And it didn't actually physically change her circumstances. But the Word of God and the promise of God fell upon her. And she found a new way, a new opening into the future. And she walked through with God's strength. She knew that God's promise to her still stands. And she was able to go on to discover that what God had promised her would become a reality. And it did. I'm thankful to say that all of us went on to come to faith in Christ. I'm, we all have a ministry of different kinds. I'm the only one who's a vicar. Um, and I'm the only one who was actually kicked out of church as a kid. So there were some struggles on the way. But God's promise still stood. It wasn't all easy. But God gave her a new strength. Do you remember that verse in the Bible? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is a promise of God on your life and on my life that will see us through. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. You know, God is bigger, as I said before, than all that can come against us. I remember uh, when I was a kid at school, I accidentally made friends with, um, we called him the cock of our school. He was a great big lad. He already shaved by the time he was 11. And uh, the thing about this lad was, I had double-decker bars in my lunchbox. I didn't like double-decker bars. I don't know why. Just didn't like them, so I always used to give them to him because he was always near me in the dining room. Anyway, one day, I got into a bit of trouble in the playground and uh, all these kids around me, and I thought, I don't, I'm not going to get out of this one. Um, but then suddenly I heard this great noise and uh, all these other kids around me that were about to beat me up scarpered. I thought, what's going on? But I looked around and I saw this lad. He's the cock of the school and he chased them all off. I thought, that was nice. I wonder why he did that. And I thought, I know why he did that. He likes me because I give him a double-decker bars. But I'll tell you what, every time I was in trouble, I always checked where he was on the playground and as soon as I saw him, I could be as cocky as a light. And that's a lovely little illustration of how God is with us in our lives. If God is for you, who can be against you? And I want to encourage us in that tonight. Hagar discovered that to be true. Abraham, Sarai, they were pretty much against her, weren't they? She had the world against her. But if God was for her, who could stand against her? God's promise stands because God sees her. And it may be today that we cannot find light. We've lost hope. It may be that we feel overcome. We're weary. It may be that we stand in the battle for life and faith. It may be that we ask God where he is when sickness and death hang over us or in the world around us or when Christians we read about are tortured and persecuted for their faith. The Open Doors World Watch List came out last week. We read that and we think, where is God? Where are you, Lord? Or where are you, Lord, when we're facing difficulty? Or when we're weighed down by sin? Or we just feel apathetic? Or life is just ordinary and mundane? Where are you, God? 
I thought you promised life in all its fullness. But God's promises still stand. You know, the Apostle Paul could write a letter from prison. And it's called the letter of joy. Because he knew that God was with him and his promise still stands. And I remember the story of a man in Romania, a man called Richard Wormbrand, who was imprisoned and in solitary confinement for years. And he wrote alone and in rags in my cell, I danced with joy. If he can say that, we can have that same joy and peace and purpose too. God's promise always stands. He promises never to leave or forsake us, Hebrews 13, 5. Jesus promises a peace even in the face of trouble, John 16, 33. He promises to guide us, Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct you in the way you should go and I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. He promises us rest. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He promises acceptance, that in Christ we are accepted by God, no longer under condemnation. Romans 8 verse 1, Romans 5 verse 1, we are now justified just as if I had never sinned. I have peace with God. No one can take that away. Acts 1 verse 8, he promises us power by the by the Holy Spirit, when he comes, you will receive power. The Holy Spirit given, Romans 5, verse 5, poured into our hearts the love of God through the Holy Spirit. He promises us a wonderful new identity, John 1, verse 12, the right to become the children of God. We have eternal security and eternal life in Christ, Jesus says in John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. You see, tonight, folks, God sees you wherever you are. His promises still stand. They are for you to claim. Like my mum, speak the word of God over your life. Hear the stories of how God has acted. Lift up your faith. Be lifted up in hope because God is with you. He is with us. And wherever you are now, I just want you to take hold of that. I want you to lift up your hands. I want you to clap in thanks to God. I want you to respond in a way that is appropriate to you. To get on your knees if you're desperate and ask God to come in because he promises, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. I promise if you op hear my voice and I open the door tonight, I will come in and eat with you. I'm going to finish with this because I've been speaking for a long time. But in Pilgrim's Progress... In Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Christian says, actually at the beginning of the book, I seek a place that can never be destroyed, one that is pure and that fadeth not away, a place that is laid up in heaven and safe there to be given at the time appointed to them that seek it with all their heart. And then at the end of the book, he writes this, he says, my marks and my scars I carry with me to be a witness for me that I have fought his battles, who now will be my rewarder. So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. That is where we're going. We are going to walk in to God's glorious, eternal kingdom, with all the trumpets, with all the great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. And it will be worth every moment of pain that we have faced. It'll be worth every effort because God has prepared good things for us and he will stand with us in it. I'm going to close there, but I just want to lead us now into a time of response. So let's just uh, be still for a moment. I want to just invite you to come now and offer your heart to the Lord, to take that one thing that has impressed upon you this evening. What is it that God has been speaking to your heart?
So just stay in that moment. We're not uh, in a rush. Um, so just stay in that moment with God, just waiting. Don't be scared of the silence, don't uh, let yourself be distracted, but just stay, stay focused on him. Tonight is an opportunity for some of us to, to grow. Maybe it's felt over lockdown like um, we've been growing stale, at, you know, not being able to meet together and to worship in the same way that things have grown a bit stale over that time. Actually, through what Mike was saying tonight, I believe that God is speaking to us and asking us to grow. In 2 Peter 3, it says that, um, in fact, Peter is encouraging the churches and he says that he wants us to grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus. To grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus. He sees you. And sometimes we think that growth is about <sighs> what everybody else sees and growing to them, but actually God sees it all. And we're encouraged to grow in grace. So just wherever you are, just allow him to pour out his grace upon you. Lord, we want more grace. We know that you see everything. You see us as we are. And yet still you love us. I was, um, I was really struck by that story that Mike told about his mum, about that moment where she just cried out to God and she just told him kind of what was on her heart and what she needed and she heard him speak in this really um, real and specific way to her and I felt like some of us this evening need to know that that is how God sees us and that is how God speaks to us, that perhaps some of us have got into that way of thinking of, well, you know, God, God loves me and, and he kind of speaks to me, but just because he loves everybody, that's what he's meant to do, he's God. But there was something in that story that was so beautifully personal and specific. God knows what we need and, and he 
wants us to speak to him and kind of however we are at that you know so in in some moments that's with with joy and praise and thanksgiving and in some moments it's like flat on our face wailing and and anything in between and so for some of us tonight I think we need to be reminded that whatever is going on we can just tell God just like it is and I want to really encourage you just in this time now as we respond to God um maybe some of you aren't used to this kind of worship and this kind of ministry um, and, and maybe some of you are used to it but but on that big stage kind of way where there's there's people around to pray with you and and there's kind of that atmosphere and and it's different isn't it when we're on our, our own at home but wherever you are right now God is just as real to you in that space as on you know on the big stage and in the big venue so it's okay if there's no one there to pray with you or or whatever. You can encounter God right now in this moment, wherever you are, if you just open yourself up and um, allow him to meet you. Holding on to you. I'm holding on. I'm holding on to you. My friend, is I'm holding on. Holding on to you, I'm holding on. I'm holding on to you. For you are good. And your love endures Yeah, you are good And your love endures He is faithful Oh, I'm holding on I'm holding on to you. Oh, I'm holding on. I'm holding on to you. And I'm holding on. I'm holding. your love endures yeah you are good and your love endures I declare the truth today that you are good and your love endures. Yeah, you are good. And your love 
Imagine life in joy. Oh, you love in joy. No matter what the circumstance. Oh, you love in joy. Mike talked um, a bit about promises, and I had a sense as um, he was speaking that perhaps there are some of us who have just grown a bit uh, discouraged um, and lost some hope. Um, Perhaps it's quite a specific thing. Perhaps there was a particular promise that you thought you'd heard God make. You thought, you know, whatever it might be, you thought this thing was going to happen, and it hasn't happened, and you've perhaps just lost hope and you're kind of wondering if, if that thing is ever going to happen. Um, and I guess my word isn't about the specifics of that, if, if, if that thing will or won't happen, but it's about that, that sense in which we continue to trust in God, um, no matter what, that, his, um, that he's good, that he's faithful, that he's kind, that he's got um, like our best at heart. Um, and so I think the encouragement was that whatever... You know, if 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 that feels like it's for you, whatever that promise um, was, that you just kind of keep holding on to the goodness and the kindness of God. And um, I think that's what one thing is promise. I think there's another thing of vision. And I think maybe some of us tonight, watching here and joining in, uh, we're all together here online. And I think for some of us, it's uh, loss of vision. It's just that whole sense of, you know, you just can't seem to see a way out. You can't seem to see a way forward. You can't seem to get out of uh, this situation that you might be in tonight. And if that's you, I want to encourage you. And in fact, I want to pray for you as well, that God will break those chains uh, of you feeling trapped and lack of vision. The other thing that I really want, that God has sort of impressed onto my mind and my heart, is that the God who sees you, this story you've been hearing about Hagar, is about a God who wants to encounter us. We are encountering him. It's about coming into an encounter right now with him. And I believe that what he wants to do is to minister to a number of you where you are, an actual sense of his presence and his spirit so that you know that God is real and he's there with you. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to ask for those of you, if that's you, I want you just to hold up a hand or hold out your hands. And I want you now to receive the presence and the Spirit of God, the God who sees you. So hold out your hands. I pray over you. Come Holy Spirit. for those who have their hands held out to God tonight, or you just want to go deeper with him, holding out your hands, I bless you in Jesus' name with with fresh encounter, with the joy of the Lord is your strength. And wherever you are now, I say, come Holy Spirit. Receive his spirit as he comes upon you. Just wait upon him. thank you for what you're doing, Lord, in these homes, in these hearts, in these minds. Um, Thank you, Lord. I just believe for loads of people that just sort of experience all sorts of wonderful things now. He knows what you need. So just continue to receive from him. For those who've maybe they've just lost the sense of God's promise. those who've lost vision. I bless the work of God in each one of you, that he breaks those chains in the name of Jesus. 
and lifts you up tonight. Stepping in, Lord, to your promises. You are faithful, Lord. I'm stepping in, Lord, with confidence. You are faithful. He is faithful, he is faithful. Oh, he is faithful, he is faithful. She won't let go. She is faithful, he is faithful. Oh, he is faithful, he is faithful. those words holding on came from a place of um, when me and Lois were reading about um, 
the woman who had, had been bleeding. She was holding on to the just the, the corner of the garment of, that she could grab of Jesus. You know, she was holding on. If I could just reach for, if I could just grab for. And there had been years of waiting, years of no healing, years of no breakthrough. But the faith involved, just the holding on, the keep going, the keep going. So let faith rise as we sing those words, holding on. Let faith rise, just that touch of the garments. God is moving here in this space. The Holy Spirit is moving here now. Oh, I'm holding on. I'm holding on to you. And I'm holding on. Holding on to you, I know you have the best for me, God. Oh, I'm holding on, I'm holding on to you. Holding on to you. But for you are good and your love endures. You are And your love endures. I hold on to those promises. Yeah, you are good. And your love endures. Yeah, you are good. And your love endures. on you Have your way, have your way, have your way in us. We don't want to rush out of this this moment. We want to let you do what you want to do, God. And yeah, 
we just choose to give ourselves to you this week through everything that we do. Remind us of your promises. Remind us of your grace and your goodness. Remind us of who we are. Remind us that your church is alive. That's the um, formal end of this evening. If you're in a bit of a moment and you want to stay in that moment, I encourage you to do that. But we're just wanting to um, encourage you to come to the next uh, New Wine Merseyside online event, which is on the 23rd of May. Um, and so um, we'd love to see you there again. We'd love you to invite people, to invite your churches to come and join us. And we hope you had a fantastic evening. And uh, we hope that um, God's spirit was poured out wherever you are. And so, um, yeah, that's all from, from us here. Thank you very much. challenges ahead. The winds rise and we are overwhelmed and we find ourselves weary from the battering of the storm. But God's presence is with us in the darkness beyond the loss. As the clouds part, we rejoice. With spirits refreshed and vision restored, we dare to dream together and to look forward once again. The time has come to encourage one another, to strengthen ties. We will set out expectantly, full of faith and hope for what lies ahead. Passion for mission renewed, purpose and direction revealed. Oh, look around, people of God, and rejoice, for he is making all things new beyond the storm. <laughs>